Ephesians, technically we're in Ephesians chapter 5, talking about the family. Aristotle said that the family is the nucleus, is the nucleus, the center of all society. Some think that the Apostle Paul here in chapter 5 and into chapter 6 is actually calling upon um, that, that Greek understanding of what the family is because there are four components that he recites and they're very common in the Greek world. The wives first, the husbands are there, the children, and then it regards slaves and masters. That slaves and masters has a much different orientation in that ancient Greek culture than it does in our culture today, actually regarded as part of the family. And so our framework is, is much different than that. But it, it's become known throughout the centuries as the household code. The household code. And so there are principles and uh, teachings that are directed towards each part of the household or the household code. We've all got families, don't we? We've all got families, don't we? Anybody know what I mean? Well, we, you know, I don't really like that phrase, you can choose your friends, but you can't choose your family. I, I, I love my family. Uh, uh, my personal family as I was growing up, and my family as a married person, and now the adopted family that I have, my in-laws and that sort of thing, I, I love them. I, I love them dearly. Interesting stories. Isn't it fun to sit down and talk about uh, different trajectories on uh, people that are in our family? Some of them have chosen some interesting paths. And others are more like us. You get along with some. You don't get along with others. It, it's Family is, is, is family. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22, and going on through the end of that chapter and on into the chapter 6, we're talking about this nucleus of the family. And it begins with wives, and he says that, that, that terrible word that a lot of people are just shunning from, wives, be submissive to your husbands. He talks about as the church is submissive to Christ. Husbands are to lay down their lives for their wives uh, as head of their wives, that headship. That's the other side of the negative coin that's kind of under great scrutiny today. So children, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath. Slaves, honor your masters by working diligently. The, the nucleus of the family what I have said to you before is that I believe, or that is, I don't believe that the Apostle Paul is stopped talking about the gospel, which he has been doing for at least one, two, three, even I would say into four and five. He hasn't stopped talking about the gospel in order to start talking about the family. I think he's continuing a conversation about the gospel. Uh, Paul Tripp has written about this. I showed this to you last week in the book, What Did You Expect? He says this, We mistakenly treat the Bible as if it were arranged by topic. One of our problems is we have not used the Bible biblically. And this has set us up for surprises we shouldn't have had. We don't use the Bible biblically. Now, I want to press this with you. I want to press this with you because I think that this is very applicable to the family. In some sense, you might say this sermon today is all about application of last week's sermon. Now, I realize many of you didn't hear that. You can go online and get that. But I'll review enough so that you're not lost along the way. But what I'm simply saying is this, that if the Apostle Paul has not stopped talking about the gospel in order to talk about the family, that in talking about the family, he's applying the gospel, that means the gospel applies to your family. And all too often, we think of the gospel as just that which happens when somebody doesn't know the Lord, 
that is when somebody's not a Christian and how they become a Christian instead of applying the gospel to our daily lives and in this case our family lives and so in some sense I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 1 and walk through now I pointed out about 67 principles for the family between chapter 1 and chapter 5 that apply to the family. That's tongue-in-cheek. We're supposed to kind of, oh boy. Tim Chesters has written a book, Gospel-Centered Families. And in it he indicates this, flourishing families are the result of, flourishing families are the result of living as a part of God's story and letting God's good news shape your values, attitudes, and behaviors. So the gospel, God's, God's plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation actually should be applied in the family. That shouldn't be a shocking statement. That should be a, sure, that's a no-brainer. But I'm wondering about that as we go through just these eight principles of the gospel to be applied in the family. I think that they will highlight for you a few things that maybe we, I don't know, we forget altogether, maybe we take for granted. I know that as Sandy and I work through these, have worked through them with them in, in our children, that they bring up a different perspective, different flavor when you say, oh, you mean I'm actually supposed to do that with my wife? You mean I'm actually supposed to treat my children that way? I'm actually supposed to be rearing, growing my children to act that way toward one another? This might be a, a, a new application. Let's take a look at number one. As the book opens up, I would suggest to you that the family is God's design. The family is blessed by God. How does Ephesians start? Now, I was kidding, of course, about the 67 different things. I have selected, and this is this 30,000-foot flyover. But I wanted us to begin in the positive place that the gospel begins. Does the gospel begin in Genesis chapter 1? God creating, God creating in his image, after his design? That's a great thing. Look where he begins this Ephesian letter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. The family is blessed. You know, I would think that if I were you and I were sitting there and saying, oh, well, the pastor's going to preach about the family today. Oh, boy, we better get ready. I mean, we're in a conservative church, and we're about to hear statistics, and I have some, and we're about to hear stories about the disintegration of the family. And, and sometimes this kind of preaching and teaching and writing of books actually forgets the good news of the good news. It, it actually forgets where God began. In fact, God, in establishing the, the family from the very beginning, said this is the one thing that is very good. It's a very good thing. These things that he said about man should not be alone. A husband and wife cleave to one another to leave father and mother. Folks, this, we need to remember this is before the fall. This is a good thing. This is the kind of thing that God has established and blessed. And here in this particular text, if we're talking about the family and it applies, then he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. When's the last time you thought about your family being blessed with every spiritual blessing? Well, I know that, that as he goes through the metaphor in chapter 5, it, he says it very clearly. I, I'm talking about a mystery. When I'm talking about husbands and wives and the duties and the things that they're doing, I'm talking about a mystery. I'm talking about Christ and his church as a family. Christ and his church in equating it to the family. So I think that I'm at full liberty here to say, you know something? For those of you who are in Christian homes, God has blessed you with every spiritual blessing. He's created you in his image. Now, 
in each of these, I may have the negative side of the coin to flip over. Families, he's created you in his image, but not to replace his image. Families, he has created you in his image, but he's not replacing that image. Today, um, there can be this kind of emphasis on the family, focusing, not trying to, no pun intended, love the folks on focus on the family, not, not going there, but so focusing on the family that it tends to replace the image of God. In fact, some would go so far as to make family their religion. And we see that everything in our society can take the place of the family of God. So now that we have all the sports, we have all the music and the dance and the things that our kids can be involved with, we say that every single one of them in, a, in, in some kind of hierarchical pattern can take the place of my relationship with my brothers and sisters in Christ. It's just a given. We have been created in God's image not to take away or not to replace his image with the family. The family has every gift, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Number two. I've aided eight of these. Number two. Looking on down in this particular passage in Ephesians chapter 1 and get to verse 15 for this reason. And so that means it's a prayer. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and your love towards the saints. Do not cease giving thanks to you. And then he prays for them for wisdom down further in 17, of revelation in the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. I desperately believe that we need a word of hope. That is that the family needs God's vision of hope today. We need it. Which one of us really isn't tired of watching the news and just in fact, some of you said to me, you know what? I don't even do that anymore. I'm not watching this anymore about the things that are going on around us because of so much negativity, even about the family, to such an extent that we're not we're not saying, wait a minute. If God established the family, if God created the family, if God blessed the family from the beginning, then there's hope for the family. Pew Research is out this month with, uh, with a new report. They've asked 2,691 people to respond. Uh, randomly chosen adults whether seven trends were good, bad, or basically irrelevant. And the result of that on the family is this. Uh, that there are uh, the positive side as the secular world would look at it. More unmarried couples raising children today. That's a good thing. More gay and lesbian couples raising children today. That's a good thing. More single women having children without a male partner to help raise them. More people living together without getting married. More mothers of young children working outside the home. More people of different races marry each other. And on this particular blog, they ask people... Really, in this, in this report, what we want you to do is we want you to respond to it. And so you go down the list of looking at people, and, they, and the, the responses come out that we need to redefine exactly what family is. And the, the end result is family is whatever you want to make it. Family is whatever you want to call it. And we see the disintegration of the nuclear family. In fact, they don't even like the word. What do you mean, nuclear family? What does that mean? The idea of a mother and a father and children and maybe a pet is it, something that makes up the family today. And you look at it, and you look at the news, and you say, where is the hope? Where is the hope? Where is the hope? Why, the hope is gone. No! If you're getting the point of this sermon, 
The hope is in the same place it's always been. Say it again. The hope is in the same place it's always been. Who created the family? Did North America create the family? We do not want to replace what we've already said in God establishing the family, God creating the family in his image with the North American concept. If we do, then you're right. There is no hope. But if there is hope for the family today, it's not in Washington, and it's not in Pew Reports, it's not in the counselor's office. Hope hasn't been lost. Hope is still in the same place it's always been in the gospel. When's the last time you thought about that? In each one of these, as I go down and think about the family and the family challenges, I think about the family members who don't know the Lord, the family members who are in trouble one way or the other, and, and the grieving thing that comes into our family about nephews and nieces and little people and great nephews and great nieces and the world that they face, and we can all get in somewhat of a tizzy. Until we say, God, we depend upon you and your grace for hope for the future. You've said it. Wow, is there any hope for this next generation? You've said it. Wow, you know, you're sitting around and listening to the news. Wow, is there any hope for this next generation? And if you know the Lord Jesus, it ought to come back as absolutely yes. There's great hope for this next generation. Why, we ought to be on the positive side of it. The gospel-centered family is looking at the gospel alone. Not in a world that is around us. Is there any hope for the family? I would say absolutely yes. Number three, though, it comes in Ephesians chapter 2. There it is. Is it for the family? I think it is for the family. And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of air, the spirit that is now worked in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Guess who you live with? The family is made up of sinners. The family is made up of little and big sinners. We're all sinners. We, we, we come into the world in a broken state. It's not just when they're born, but by nature we are children of wrath. By volition we are children of wrath. And we choose to do things in rebellion to a holy God. And unfortunately, there are the already aspects of the Christian life that are true in our lives, and there are the not yet aspects that are yet to be fulfilled in our lives, which means we continue to wrestle with this thing called sin. And in the family, moms and dads, what we need to remember is this sin nature is not temporary. It's not temporary. We act in the family. Do we not? Do we not act in the family? Haven't I told you that before? <laughs> Didn't I tell you to... We talked about this last week, and I told you. And we live 24-7 with sinners. We are, we are broken people. And you husbands, you wives, you children are going to look for ways to heal that brokenness. Do you remember a few weeks ago I put out the whiteboard out here? We had three circles up there, had God's design on one, then sin entered into the world, and then we had another circle and had squiggly lines going out, and those squiggly lines represent all the ways in which we try and fix it, all the ways in which we try and mend this. We're living with sinners, and this is, if I may, a little bit on the pet peeve side, a little bit over here on this soapbox. One of these days I'm going to put a soapbox right here. Every time I step up on it, you're going to know that this is, this is the thing that's going on. The, the Christian counselors love the Christian counselors. But if I were to speak to 
a, a, a conference on Christian counselors, I would say, do not forget the gospel. So often we're infiltrated with the new techniques of today. We're living with sinners, and we need the blood of Jesus Christ to cover that sin. We're living with sinners. I live with a sinner. My wife lives with a sinner. Okay? We know this. And it rears its ugly head. The question for us, in my opinion, comes in the next principle, which is number four in the same chapter. As we get down four and following, but God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. He made us alive. He made us alive together. I'm grateful for that in my marriage. Um, I came to know the Lord in, in 1976, and um, I had run the world. I was about, I guess I should know, 20, I was almost 24 years old and um, had been traveling all over the world, been living as a single guy up in Orlando. Sandy and I had known each other as co-workers at Walt Disney World. And God, in his grace, led me to a, a, a home Bible study where a group of people, young people, were sitting around studying the Bible and that sort of thing. And I looked at these people like they were weird, man. I looked at them like they were aliens. I said, what kind of language are you people? And, and I kept meeting with this group. And one night I was at home reading my Bible, John 15, the vine and the branches, and realized that I was not connected to that vine and branch. I was not connected to him. And I asked him at that point to become boss of my life, for him in, in biblical language to become Lord of my life. But you know what? I didn't want to be, I didn't want to just, I didn't want to be a hermit. Let's just say it like that. And so I, uh, I said, who do I know that's a nice person? Who do I know that's a nice girl? And I called Sandy up and we went roller skating. And, and uh, the, the rest is history. Why do I tell you that? Well, I'm thrilled about it. Love to tell the story over and over again. Love it. You know something? It wasn't long. We were sitting on a bench, Lake Iola, there in the center of Orlando. And she said, you're different. You're, you're something. What's happening there? And I told her of what Christ has been doing in my life, love of the Word of God. And you know what God did? God made us alive together. When's the last time you looked at a family member? Well, I know you're a sinner. <laughs> God has made us alive together. Wow! I bet you if, if, if I got a chance to listen to your story and the details of it, there's probably somewhere along the line where you're going to say, I didn't think we were coming out of that one. <laughs> I didn't think we were going to, you know, that valley was so deep, those challenges were so hard, those finances were this, that health situation was that. We were, you know, boy, it didn't look like it was going to happen there. And you looked at one another and you said, yeah, but God has made us alive together. Probably never happened. I gotta, I'm going to confess it. It's never happened in our marriage. I'm Okay. It doesn't have to mean those exact words. And so, I, yeah, we have. We've said things like, God's still on his throne. He's still seated in the heavenly places. He does what he pleases. He is in charge. Yeah, you can say it different ways. But I tell you that story about us because literally, God made us alive together. That's a great thing, husbands and wives. And when the kids come to know the Lord, oh, look at those children as children of the living God. God has made this child alive together with us. Yeah, we're still going to go through the struggles, but God has made us alive together. When we think about the context in Ephesians, I understand about it. Paul is writing to the church and he's saying to the church, it's not just Jews only, it's Gentiles, that he's broken down the wall. Things used to separate us, but now he's put us together, made us alive together. 
I, I understand that. But I think it's very applicable to the family, and I'll show you why. In, in, this, in this next one, Alive Together. Elise Fitzpatrick wrote a book called Give Them Grace, primarily directed towards children. But here's what they say. Uh, Fitzpatrick and, and Thompson both wrote the book, so I've got to give Thompson the credit. Offered their gospel-centered answer this way. Paul is telling parents to daily proclaim the message about Jesus to their children and to warn or rebuke them when they forget to live in the light of what Jesus has already done. He was telling them to tether every aspect of their parenting to the gospel message. To tether every aspect of their parenting to the gospel message. That's what's happening. That's what's happening this morning in this room. I am saying to husbands and wives and to parents, tether, tether your parenting, tether your marriage relationship to the gospel message. That's what Ephesians is doing. That's what I think Paul is doing in Ephesians when he turns to the family. He says, in light of everything that I've said, you were created good, that you fell the way that you fell, that you struggled, but there is hope because God has made us alive together. Those are marriage principles. Those are parenting principles. That's what I believe that he's doing. Give them grace. Number five. Number five, as we look into further into this particular passage of Scripture, therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles, and, and there he goes, and I'm not going to read the whole text. He's off saying, at one time you were alienated. At one time you were separated. You weren't a part of the family. But now God has put you together. The family has been made one by God. Husbands and wives. Therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife. And the two shall be one. It's a mystery. He speaks of Christ and his church. Eli Finkel has written an interesting statement here. We desire more from potential spouses than in previous eras. What is he going to say? He's writing and he's saying in this generation, more particularly in the millennial, what they're doing is they're requiring more of their either future spouse or their spouses that they have. They're requiring more of them. So I've got you in the right paradigm there. They're requiring more of their spouses than ever, ever before. Not just shelter and survival or love and intimacy. We demand self-actualization in, in the all-or-nothing paradigm of personal fulfillment. The reason I'm marrying you is because of what you can do for me. I, I'm searching. Think about it. When's the last time you watched one of the, the commercials for dating and online? The next time you see it, see if the commercial is not directed toward what, what we can find. We can find somebody else that'll do this for you. We can find somebody else that'll do this for you. We can find somebody else that you match and you figure that's going to be more compatible for me. And more than any other generation, we're looking for a spouse who can deliver full fulfillment. And yet the Christian worldview is different. To marry is to give yourself away, to find that you gain another person. That's a different worldview. Totally different perspective. Not marrying for what my self-actualization can be, but to marry is to give yourself a way to find that you gain another person and that your union exudes more life than the calculated transactions between two allied individuals. What that last penalty said was, oh, no, 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 don't, don't misunderstand us. You know, she brings this to the table and he brings this to the table and we come together and we're, we're just better together than we are separated like that. And, and that is not the biblical perspective because that still brings two people to the same table separately. And the biblical perspective says the two become one, that you 
give yourself away that you can see by the uniting of two to one that the two glorify God better than the two can separately. That's a different worldview altogether. Number six. The family is made up of different gifts. And I skipped over some passage here, but I go to, to chapter 4, verse 7, in which it reads, But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gifts. Now, which one of you hasn't said, if you have two children, two, three, four, five, talk to a guy this week with seven kids? Whew. Boy, I bet, you know, uh, which one hasn't said, you know, they are not alike? I mean, after seven, I'm beginning to think maybe two of them are a little bit alike or a little bit more alike. But you, you stand around the grocery store, you're at the club meeting, you're at the Bible study or whatever, and you get into a conversation and you say, I've got multiple kids, but you know they are so different. They are so different from each other. But when's the last time you and I said, wow, that must be the way God has gifted them. That must be the way that God has gifted them. We're so quick to choose the, the almost negative side of it and yet to stand back and say, that's the gifting of God. Certainly, he says in chapter 2 and chapter 3, he's talking a great deal about the oneness and the uniting, as I've already said. But in that uniting, as we said about the gospel, we can say about the family that God has gifted each one in the family according to his good pleasure. You see what it says? It is a grace gift. Look at that verse again. But, but grace was given to each one. Grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. According to Christ. The Lord our God has made each member of the family. It's not a matter of being right and wrong. It's a matter of being different. Mandy and I noted that through, through the years. She loves for me to talk about her in the sermon. You know, we're just two different. I grew up in Washington, D.C., we didn't have just one football team. We had two football teams. Why, my mother drove a school bus in the morning, and she would finish driving the school bus. She'd go to the local drugstore, and in would come half of the Washington Redskins football team because we lived about a mile and a half or so away from the training center outside of Washington and Virginia. And all these guys lived in the area, and before they'd go to training camp for that day, they'd come in there and sit down at the uh, uh, drugstore, have a cup of coffee. My mom would finish driving the bus. She'd go in there. She'd sit down in one of the booths and she'd proceed to tell them everything they did wrong that day before. You know? <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. You shouldn't have done this. Yeah, I'm sure they love seeing her. They're like, oh, they should see her. Let's go someplace. I mean, she could tell them everything. You know, blocks and tackles and plays and things that they should do. My wife grew up in Central Florida. I mean, before there was a Tampa Bay, I mean, Miami was down here for sure. That was like five hours away from where she grew up. Her mama didn't care about football. Her daddy didn't care about football. She didn't care about football. And that's just a silly little thing to say, wow, we were different. We were different. And God has made us one and grown us together. But you know what? We're still different. We're still different. When's the last time you looked at your spouse to say, that's the way God has gifted you. That's a grace gift of the way that God has gifted you. I love the way God has gifted you. Why, Ephesians chapter 4 says that that's the way you are and the talents and the gifts that you are is the way that God has made you. It's gospel. That's the gospel applied to marriage. Say that. Go home there. You can say it right now. Reach over there with me and say, I just love the way God's gifted. Is that good? It's good. It's wonderful. The gospel in the marriage relationship. Number seven. Number seven. Wow. In this principle of the gospel being in the family, the family being rooted and grounded in the gospel, the family has new values of the mind and the mouth. Now we're getting down to the rubber here. 
The family has new values of the mind and of the mouth. Look in chapter 4. In 17, he starts out, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in futility of their minds. The way that we think. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated in the life of God because of ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. Every single one of these, honestly, do need another sermon. They really do. But when we talk about growing and learning and having our minds shaped. I want to know, in the family, where is our family worship? Where is our devotional time as a family? Now listen, I tried. All through the years, we did different things. We met at the dinner table. We'd break out the Bible. We'd get the rolling of the eyes. Sometimes, not always. Nothing like when I had tried to get the family to sing. You know, the Bible says, hey, to greet one another, songs, hymns, spiritual songs. I think we ought to sing together, just the four of us. Yeah, it just, it didn't go. I don't know what will work with your family and won't work with your family. But right here, I do know that if I'm applying the gospel principles to the family, he wants us to grow in our understanding. And everything that we can say about Christianity today in its biblical illiteracy, and there's much to be said, about the fact that we don't know the Bible, that we don't know some of the simplest doctrine. Where should it happen? Somebody say to me, where should the teaching, oh, well, the church this, church that. You know, this is a great church. We've got some of the best teaching. I, I told the starting point, wonderful. Love the teachers that we have here. Where should teaching start? It should start that table right there. You say, well, I'm not that theologically astute. Well, if you can read. Hey, even if you can't read, one of you can read. One of you can practice. You can talk to the children. You can nurture them. You can grow them up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Which one of you wants to look at your child and say, um, um, well, I know your mind is futile and that you're darkened in your understanding and that you're ignorant. Text says. It's a prayer. He's praying for them. I'm praying for you and praying for our families that we would at those dining tables. Honestly, honestly, I think that one of the things that God used to bring me to Himself was my father, who at the time was not a Christian, would take out the big family Bible with all those big glossy pictures. You know, you remember those glossy pictures in there? You know, the Renaissance pictures of the different things. Big glossy pictures. There's there's, uh, there's King Solomon sitting on his throne, two women down there begging on their, uh, uh, him with a sword in his hand. Okay, let's cut the baby in half. You don't know that story? You don't have time for it. But my father, <laughs> my father would relate that story to me. It happened at the dinner table. And God used that, I believe, to give me a hunger for his word even when we were children, and even when he wasn't a Christian. We're not to be ignorant. We need family values of the mind, but also he goes into great depth, back and forth in the letter. Interesting things of not only the mind, but also of the mouth. After putting off and putting on, as Frank gave us, verse 25 of chapter 4, therefore having put away falsehood, let each one speak the truth. Oh, well, you know, with his neighbor. Doesn't it say? Speak truth with his neighbor. Praise God, my wife's not my neighbor. I don't have to speak truth to her. What? But speaking the truth. For we are members of one another. Bam! We are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. Do we need a whole sermon right there? Wow. Let me tell you, folks, that's tough. Oh, read the text. Want to follow God? All right, let's talk. I don't think so. Right? Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity for the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor. Honestly, it says, let no, verse 29, corrupt Look at it. Let no corrupt talk 
come out of your mouth, but such is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Wife, husband, I don't want to let a word come out of my mouth that is not good for building you up. So look at husbands and wives and use the gospel message that our values would be renewed in our mind and that we would have a worldview and that would follow through with this thing that James says no one can tame. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth. Anybody? I can't read. This hand's got to go down. The gospel. And then finally, Number eight, I wish it ended in a different way, but this is the text in which it it comes, and that is the family is sacred territory. Why do you wish that it ended differently? Because it goes through and talks in detail about the immorality that, that can destroy you and the immorality that is destroying American families. According to CDC, nearly one in five women in the United States is a rape victim. According to Barna, 41% of young children, excuse me, 41% of young Christian, say it again, 41% of young Christian men regularly seek out pornography. And a staggering 72% of non-Christian young men do likewise. It's a statistical impossibility. It's a statistical impossibility that your family, friendships, church, and marriage aren't in some way haunted by sexual immorality. It's impossible. It is the new norm. It is all around us, all the time, at the click of a button. And we've spoken about this in general. But now I want to go back to our text that we have, or at least that I started. And and I want to say that understanding wives being submission to your husband is contingent upon husbands laying down your life for the wife. Husbands laying down your life as Christ laid down his life for the church. And, and we, could, we could go into a great deal of length of how to get your kids stop eating so much sugar, screen time. We can go through the principle. But until we have men who are willing to lay their lives down for the family, we are in danger already heard what I said about hope. We have hope. Well then, Pastor, where, where is it? Where is it? It is in us confessing, falling on our faces, and, and, and asking God for the grace and mercy that comes in the gospel. That's why the Apostle Paul is introduces, not because Be not drunk with wine. As I said before, it's not dietary. But be spirit-filled because you cannot lay your life down. You cannot be, you cannot exhibit the submissiveness to the authority of a husband like, like the church is to the Lord. You cannot do these things apart from being spirit-filled. This is spiritual warfare. That's why he follows this dialogue about the family right into spiritual warfare. And so I want to encourage you today. Each one of you have been created in God's design. Each one of you have been created in God's image. Each one of you in various ways have sought to rebel against God. The biblical word for that is sin. And because of it, and folks, you can look to the right, you can look to the left. Because of it, every one of us is broken. We may be broken in different ways, but every single one of us is broken. Maybe you're dealing with the sexual 
immoralities. Maybe you're dealing with the gender identification. Maybe you're dealing with how to use your money or you're dealing with that continual anger problem. Maybe you're dealing with those family relationships that, oh God, why can't I be like somebody else? Let me tell you, folks, that somebody else is And God took that brokenness upon himself, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He who knew no sin became sin on our behalf and took that righteousness and put it on us. Oh, well, then that creates the perfect family. No, it doesn't, because we continue to wrestle in there. But I'm asking you today, hear the words of the gospel for and with the people you live with and apply the gospel in your family. And what will happen? What, if she, just wondering what's going on in your mind. What will happen? What will happen is exactly what the text says will happen. It will be to the praise and to the glory of God the Father. It will be to the praise of his holy name. It will be to him who is gathering all things unto himself. It will be to his majesty and to his fame. That's the direction. So I'm going to pray with you right now. I'm going to pray that God would help you to see these biblical principles, these gospel-centered, are applicable, are applicable to the life of your family. Pray with me, would you? God, I pray that you would take your word. I, I pray, actually, Lord, that that you would use your word so mightily this morning that husbands and wives and families, maybe single people grouping up together, say, let's read back through. Let's read back through these three, four, five chapters. Let's read back through these and see how we're supposed to be applying these by God's spirit, by God's grace in the life of our family. Lord, help us to see that our only hope is in you. Help us to see that our only hope is in the victory of raising from the dead that you make us alive. God, I pray you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand with me? We want to respond to God's word and also ask God to help prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper this morning.